Um, let me start by, uh, first out by saying uh, congratulations. Uh, first, to your parents um, and other caregivers that are here today. And to the teachers and professors who shared this journey with you. And of course, to you, the Macaulay Honors graduates. You made it. You are about to be college graduates. Congratulations. Which is more than I can say about myself. I am not a college graduate. And uh, look, I'm here talking to you. So my point is, you really don't need this degree. Um, but now that you have it, good for you, well done. College graduates, well done. Um, even though we, can, we can give a round of applause to you. Even those who are uh, taking a couple of summer classes to finish up but still get to walk uh, during graduation. I didn't graduate from college, but I did go to college. Uh, my parents, like many of yours, were immigrants, and when we came to this country, my parents didn't have the money to send me to college, and we didn't have the kind of visa that would have let me pay in-state tuition. So finishing became too expensive. And since my folks also didn't have the Photoshop skills to put my head on the body of a pole vaulter, I couldn't get a scholarship to USC. <laughs> hey, not all of us were lucky enough to be raised by Lori Laughlin, okay? <laughs> so I was incredibly nervous coming here today to address you all. This is the first time anyone has ever asked me to give a commencement speech, and the thought of sharing any knowledge with you young people seemed like a daunting task. Uh, one of the things you will learn as you continue to progress in life is that people assume you know a lot more than you actually do. And you spend a great deal of time pretending you know a lot more than you actually do. Uh, when you feel that way, you will, uh, and you will, you will feel that way, just know that you're, you're not alone. Others are pretending too. Anytime anybody says the words, trust me, I know what I'm talking about, they're lying. <laughs> trust me, I know what I'm talking about. Today you are living in a world that is moving faster than it ever has. And I don't just mean the speed at which we are headed toward global annihilation because of climate change. When I was your age, not graduating from college, there was no internet, there were no iPhones. Facebook was a command. The <laughs> The cloud was just weather. If I wanted to know the answer to something, I couldn't just ask Alexa or Siri because everyone knew they were the two dumbest girls in our class. <laughs> and hearing the words, oh, I just followed you, would have gotten most people arrested. <laughs> but I look out at you now, and, I, and, and compared to me at your age, you're like geniuses. I mean, literally, for those of you who work at the Apple store. Oh, by the way, is, is TikTok a person or a thing? I'm not, I'm seriously, okay, you know, we can discuss it afterwards. So what can I share with you? What knowledge can I impart to you about the world that you are about to enter into? I could feed you some platitudes that you could uh, Google for yourself or get from an Instagram poet. But instead, I've decided to share with you a few quotes that have made an impact on me as I have stumbled and fumbled through my own life. Because sometimes you read something or hear something and it changes everything. And you say to yourself, I'm gonna steal that and use it in a commencement speech. <laughs> so quote number one is actually from my mother. And the quote is, be a doctor, for God's sake, Asif, be a doctor. <laughs> She'd be very proud of me today. <laughs> this was a really important thing for my parents. When, when I was born, the first thing my dad asked the nurse was, is it a doctor? <laughs> now you may be thinking, Asif, you clearly didn't become a doctor, so 
How much impact did that quote really have on you? And I will have you know, I have played many, many doctors on television and in films. So many that I could probably perform open heart surgery or definitely assist if something goes wrong in the crowd today. I got you, medically speaking. At the very least, I can comfort you by shouting stat over and over again. <laughs> the truth is there was a very good reason my parents wanted me to be a doctor so badly. As I've mentioned, they were immigrants. They were also poor, and they struggled to build an economic foundation in this country. In their minds, if I picked a professional path with stability and status, like becoming a doctor, I could save myself from that same fate. It is why they had come to this country after all. But I, unfortunately, couldn't do that. Not because I didn't have the brains. Okay, maybe I didn't have the brains. But because from the age of 10, every fiber of my being, every dream that danced in my head, pulled me towards performing and acting. You know, a profession where you can really help people who are about to die. <laughs> so as I set out on that career path as a young man around the same age as all of you, I had to come to grips with a hard and necessary fact. Sometimes, being who you are, following your own truth, will mean disappointing other people's expectations of you. Your parents, your friends, your partners, your teachers, the people that love you the most and want the best for you. It will take courage to live in your truth, but it will reap you the reward of not having to look back in regret, wondering, what if? Well, you might still, but it will be because of smaller things like, what if I had Chipotle instead of five guys? Then maybe I wouldn't be doubled over the toilet right now. Things like that. <laughs> also, if one day you choose to have children, uh, you will have expectations of them, and they will follow your example and upset those expectations. <laughs> Perhaps by declaring that their life is, life's ambition is to be an Instagram poet. And your parents will laugh and the cycle of life will proceed karmically as it should. <laughs> the second quote that really shaped me, uh, the way, the shaped the way I've come to look at life, is by that old bulldog, Winston Churchill. I know, you don't often hear an Indian person quoting Winston Churchill. <laughs> that staunch defender of British colonialism who presided over a famine that killed three million Indians. But sometimes, even people you vehemently disagree with can give you insight. So take it. Take it from wherever it comes. Actually, that's a pretty good quote. I'll use that at my next commencement speech. <laughs> anyway, old Winston said, the definition of success is stumbling from failure to failure with no less enthusiasm. Now, it is true that Churchill was an alcoholic, so he was stumbling for another reason. And most of your failures in life probably get overlooked if you, I don't know, win the Second World War and rewrite history books to gloss over your violent oppression of entire nations. But the sentiment is still powerful. Now to get here today, graduating from Macaulay Honors College, you have familiarized yourself with success by trying to structure a life, but trying to structure a life only around success is a fool's errand because you cannot avoid failure. It will find you, sometimes in big ways, sometimes in small. It is part of the human condition, but failure, if you let it, will be your greatest teacher and even your greatest inspiration. And I know it's weird to say in front of your actual professors that failure is the greatest teacher because they're like, I'm worse at my job than failure, but it's true. I moved to New York in my early 20s to pursue my dream of being an actor. I struggled for several years, getting bit parts here and there, mostly on Law & Order, where you can find me still today on YouTube playing the trifecta of Indian people parts, cab driver, deli owner, terrified witness. At the time, I was always trying to convince casting directors that I could do more than that. I was ready to take on the meaty role of wacky sidekick to the white guy leading man, or computer scientist who's a wacky sidekick to a talking robot. <laughs> Finally, the day I'd been waiting for arrived. I had an audition for a lead role in a network sitcom. 
It was a part that had actually been written for an Indian guy, like a normal Indian guy, not a guy with an accent wobbling his head back and forth, not the human version of Apu from The Simpsons. <laughs> this was huge. Back then, nobody was writing characters like this for television. This was two decades before the Mindy Project. And there were only around three Indian American actors working in the entire business. So my odds of getting this part were pretty good. One in three, which is like 50%, I think. But I didn't graduate from college, so I don't know. I went into the first audition and I killed it. It was so good, the kind of good where you walk out of a room and go spend money you don't have. Which in my case was also known as money. The producers asked me to come back the next day for a callback. I thought to myself, this is it. This is my big break. The next day, I went back into the same room and I choked. I just completely choked. Everyone looked at me with disappointment because it was clear the job had been mine to lose. And in that moment, I had lost it. I went from that audition to the corner of Rockefeller Center and 56th Street where I'd been, I had taken a job handing out flyers to tourists for $5 an hour. I felt so humiliated and ashamed. I thought to myself, if I couldn't even get this job, which seemed written for me, what chance did I have of getting any other acting job that was meaningful? I decided that afternoon that I was done. I didn't have what it took to be in this business. I'd move back to Florida, live with my parents, and hear, I told you so, for the rest of my life. I called up my friend William to commiserate and told him the story and that I was giving up. And William said to me, Asif, if you're lucky, there will be many opportunities where you're in a room like that and you're not going to get the job. And that's if you're lucky. Truth be told, William didn't really cheer me up much at the time. And I remember thinking I needed to get more supportive friends. <laughs> but he was right. That was my first taste of major professional failure and disappointment. And even though it was excruciating, it kicked my ass into gear. I decided that if I wanted to play roles that were meaty and show what I could do as an actor, I would have to write them myself and create my own work. So I began writing. So I began writing my first one-man show, Sakina's Restaurant. And a few years later, I did that play off-Broadway and won an Obie Award. And if you... Thank you. And if you don't know what an Obie Award is, it means you've never won an Obie Award. <laughs> that show became my breakthrough. It's what opened the doors to parts on Broadway, to movies, and eventually to The Daily Show, and everything that has come after that. I have failed many, many times since that fateful audition. Most of the things I do, things I create, things that I hope to accomplish, jokes that I write, result in failure. Maybe even some here today. But I have taken Churchill to heart. Well, not all of Churchill. I mean, I try not to drink first thing in the morning. But I still try my best to stumble from failure to failure with no less enthusiasm. It's not easy. And I still have to remind myself that what lies around the corner from failure may be my next big breakthrough. The third quote I want to share with you is by the writer and theologian Frederick Bruckner. Purpose is the place where your deep gladness meets the world's needs. Now back in the 1980s, Omni Magazine did a survey where they asked a question to 100 people who had lived to the age of 100 to find out what they had in common. You can ask your parents to explain what a magazine is later. But they had assumed that such a long life would be associated with a good diet or regular exercise or not smoking, etc. But they found that it wasn't the case. What all those people had in common were two things. They had not let loss and disappointment capsize their life. And two, they had something larger than themselves to live for. I would also bet that none of them ever participated in a Tide Pod eating challenge, but it wasn't mentioned in the article. <laughs> now, for much of my life, if I'm being honest, I struggled with the second of these. I always had a purpose, be a successful actor. But that purpose wasn't really connected to anything larger than my own ambition. It was, in truth, kind of self-involved. And for much of my life, I actually thought that was a necessary thing. If I was going to make it in an impossible business, it seemed to me I had to be monomaniacal. 
I didn't have time for causes or politics or activism or anything really that I did not think was directly related to my art. And then 9-11 and The Daily Show happened to me. One was an earth-shattering event that took the world and that shook the world, and the other was 9-11. Again, I was very self-involved. <laughs> when I was hired to be on The Daily Show as the all brown things correspondent, I was the first non-white correspondent that Jon Stewart hired. At first, to me, The Daily Show was just an acting job, and I wasn't even sure that it was an acting job I really wanted. I was a serious thespian in my own mind. I figured it would pay the bills. I didn't, uh, I didn't even have any sense that the show might actually mean something in the larger culture. And to viewers, as the country and the world were grappling with the fallout of the post-9-11 world. War, Islamophobia, government ineptitude. I know that today, George W. looks like a genius compared to the orange man baby that currently occupies the office, but trust me, Trust me, he was no Winston Churchill. <laughs> anyway, a weird thing started to happen after I had been on the show for a few months. People started to stop me in the street, and not just because I am very, very handsome, <laughs> and not just old Jewish grandmothers on the Upper West Side where I lived at the time either, but young brown folks would come up to me, especially Muslims, and they would tell me about how important the work we were doing on the show was to them what it meant for them to see a person who looked like me on the air skewering the bigotry that they were experiencing. I started getting invited to events to talk about Islamophobia and bigotry and current events. Honestly, at first, I had imposter syndrome. The reason they felt this way was because I was performing words written by Ivy League educated comedy writers. And I had more familiarity with the inside of bars than the inside of mosques. But I also began to realize that it was important that I engage with these issues. That my art, my talent, could not be used not only to fulfill myself and my own dreams, but perhaps also to make a dent in the world. I co-created a web series based on the Daily Show skit, I had been, and it was called Halal in the Family, to tackle Islamophobia. A study of the series showed that it markedly changed people's views of Muslims, and we won a Peabody Award. And if you don't know what a Peabody Award is, it means you don't have a Peabody Award. <laughs> when I left The Daily Show, when I left The Daily Show 10 years after I had been, after I'd been hired, it had completely changed my life. Not just in the opportunities it afforded me, but in how it changed my perspective on what art could do and what being a performer could mean as a profession. I had expanded my idea of what my purpose was beyond what I had ever imagined. So I guess what I'm saying is, hitch your gladness to the world's needs, and you too will find your purpose. Your, and you will find that your purpose can expand beyond that which you might have imagined. And be willing to accept that you may not yet know the circumstances that will bring your purpose into highest relief. Think of yourself as a sailor, and your life is a sailboat. Set a course, but the sea and the wind may not always carry you in the direction you expect or understand. And if the place you land doesn't look like the place you thought you were trying to find, it still might be exactly where you need to be. If you're thinking, Asif, I'm not a sailor. How does this apply to me? That was a test. You do not understand metaphor, and you're not allowed to graduate. <laughs> Which brings me to my next quote. The playwright Tony Kushner. Uncertainty kills, as does certainty. We all live in a world today dominated by social media and howling mobs of outrage. The Twitterverse is dominated by absolutists. You may, you may feel pressure, as I do, to jump in with a hot take, to virtue signal by lining up with one side of the mob to condemn the other, because there is a fear that if we don't, if we don't immediately announce our allegiance or our, politi or our politics, we may risk being on the wrong side of a tweet. But there is a reason that Facebook had a status update that allowed you to just note that it's complicated. Things are complicated. All of us have a piece of truth and increasingly a whole bunch of misinformation. Nuance may be the hardest thing to find and the least sexy, but it has the benefit of often being the closest thing to the truth. If you seek nuance in everything, ideas, circumstances, and people, I suspect you will find the world becomes a deeper, richer, kinder place. 
Which brings me to my final quote from that great 80s philosopher, Vanilla Ice. <laughs> Stop, collaborate, and listen. Although with all due respect to Mr. Ice, I think he had it backwards. It should be stop, listen, and collaborate. I know many of you today have gotten where you are by being very, very busy. And maybe you've had to be. You've had dual or even triple majors. You've worked while going to school. But even for you, overachievers, it is essential to take time in life and just stop and be still. That may look like different things to different people. Maybe you stop trying to force things to happen. Maybe it's meditation for 20 minutes a day. Maybe it's praying, hiking, exercising. It doesn't matter. What matters is that stopping your mind, your tasks, your idea of what you have to do is what will allow you to listen. You can also ask your parents to explain what listening is. It seems to have gone the way of the magazine. <laughs> and what are you listening for? Maybe it's to the whisper inside of you that's drowned out by all the things you're doing to keep busy. The whisper that's telling you something you really need to hear about your purpose, your family, your relationships, the path that you are on. Maybe it will guide you to your tribe, those people you will collaborate with to build your great and wonderful life. And these people, and these people, that tribe is crucial. Some of its members are likely sitting next to you today. As you face the wind and the bumps, these are the people who will laugh with you, cheer you, pick you up, dust you off, inspire you, challenge you, and tell you that if you are lucky, you will have many, many more failures, as well as great successes ahead of you. Trust me, I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so congratulations to you, the great class of 2019. I can't wait to see all of the wonderful things that you will do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Asif Manvi. Will Dean Ugaretz and Mr. McCauley join me? I'm going to read a proclamation, and uh, they will put on your doctoral hood. So. <laughs> Okay, we ready? Let's listen. Whereas Asif Hakim Manviwala, known professionally as Afimif Manvi, has worked throughout his career to explore the contradictions and balancing that immigrants undergo as they adapt to and adopt new customs, and whereas Mr. Manvi has, through comedy and drama, helped to improve the understanding and acceptance of immigrants and the role of immigration in contemporary society, and whereas, he's also shown an exemplary commitment to humanitarian assistance and disaster relief around the world in flood relief for Pakistan, earthquake relief for Haiti, the Endometriosis Foundation of America, and in various efforts to promote religious freedom in the United States and worldwide. And whereas, Mr. Manby has challenged elected officials and others with sharp, humorous commentary and interviews exposing and explaining issues of critical national and international importance and principles that are at the center of the university's purpose and mission. And whereas, Mr. Manby's one-man show, Sakina's Restaurant, which received an OBI, it's a big deal award, <laughs> further investigated through humor and vibrant emotion the struggles immigrants face in pursuing an American dream, struggles that are enormously relevant to so many students at CUNY and Macaulay, and whereas Macaulay's students, the majority of whom are immigrants or children of immigrants themselves from different countries and of different faiths, will be well served by following the exemplary commitment and contributions of Asif Manvi, making him an ideal candidate for an honorary CUNY degree from Macaulay Honors College. Be it therefore resolved that the Macaulay Honors College Award, Asif Hakim Manviwala, the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, Honoris Causa, at the college's annual commencement ceremony on June 6, 2019. I spent all this time talking and they didn't get the job done. <laughs> 